Welcome to Climate Now. I'm James Lawler. And I'm Catherine Gorman. And you're listening to our conversation with Professor Kerry Emanuel, Professor of Atmospheric Science at MIT, where he's been teaching for 40 years. Professor Emanuel is the author or co-author of over 200 scientific papers and three books. He is co-founder of the MIT Lorenz Center, a climate think tank which fosters creative approaches to learning how climate works. We covered a wide range of topics in our conversation with Professor Emanuel, and the more technical pieces of which you can watch in our video episode about the scientific underpinnings of our confidence in the fact of human-caused climate change. Here, we share the part of our conversation where we focused on how to think about what can be done about it. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us today, and welcome to Climate Now. Tell us a little bit about your background. How, how did you get where you are today? I got into this field mostly through my interest in atmospheric science and weather. And in fact, I specialize in the meteorology of the tropics with a focus on hurricanes. And a lot of my published papers in the last two decades or so have been on hurricanes. But I'm also extremely interested in climate and have been for a while. And I've taught a graduate course in climate physics now for about 20 years. I'm going to dive into my first question, which is, what is humanity's best shot at avoiding the worst effects of climate change? Well, so most of the experts that I'm fortunate enough to be able to talk to at MIT and other places say that it there isn't a magic bullet, but there is a magic combination. And I'll make, it's going to be multiple things. And what are those things? Well, in the broadest sense, we have to do two things. We have to stop emitting carbon or at least slow it down. And maybe we should can develop ways of taking carbon that's already in the atmosphere out, okay? Carbon capture, it's called. Now, we know how to do carbon capture chemically. It's just too expensive at the moment. But there's some hope that if we keep working on that technology, we can drive it down. So that's one thing. It's not a magic bullet, but it would help. The other are low... Well, it's conservation, just not produce so much carbon. I tend to think that the emphasis on that is very strongly misplaced. And the reason I think so, and a lot of energy experts, is no matter what the U.S. and the developed world does, the big deal is the hope for economic expansion of horribly poor places like much of India and Central Africa and so forth. And if they're going to grow their economies and, and address poverty, which we all hope they will, it's going to be accompanied by big, big increases in per capita energy consumption. We want that. We want that, not because we want the carbon that goes with it, but because we want the alleviation of poverty. Climate's not the only problem in the world, okay? That's probably going to happen, and even if we wanted to stop it, we couldn't. And that just swamps what we can do. It doesn't. I, I'm very conservative in that sense. I've got solar panels on my roof, and I don't like to waste things. But it isn't really going to address the problem. So what we really need to do is come up with low-carbon energy. Now, this is a complex landscape, but so far, the most effective by far ways that countries have decarbonized, at least their electricity, is by combinations of renewable, especially hydro power and nuclear power, nuclear being a very important element of that. And nuclear energy is statistically, in terms of lives lost in mining and whatever uh, accidents, nuclear power is per kilowatt generated far and away the safest energy source we've had. It's got a bad rap from mostly from environmentalists, and I'm trying to persuade them that this is, you're really hurting our efforts to decarbonize. We really have to step up nuclear. And I just published an essay in The Bridge, which is the journal of the National Academy of Engineering called Nuclear Salvation. Just the title tells you where I'm headed that way. We've got to set aside our disinformation about nuclear power and really go to town. We don't have to build 60s style nuclear power plants do that. Nuclear combined with renewables is a winning mix for that. One thing people have to be aware of is that a lot of energy that we're using today that, that involves a lot of carbon emissions has nothing to do with electricity. It's industrial heat 
to make steel and such things, you need very high temperature. And that can't be economically supplied by any electrical source. And where is that heat going to come from? If it's coming from fossil fuels, we're not going to get anywhere. But nuclear can do that. Okay. And that's one thing renewables cannot do, or at least cannot do it anywhere near efficiently. Now, the other, of course, the other thing we have to work on and are working on is storage. The thing that's limiting renewables now is is not uh, solar panels or wind turbines. They're very cheap and being produced all over the place. It's the inability to store power inexpensively from when you can generate it to, to when you need, need to use it. So all of those things. We can't put our eggs in one basket. We've got to work on all of this together. And it's going to be some combination, and the combination will differ from one place to another. But if we do this in combination, I think there's no question we could solve this. And we could solve it, and I estimate in the essay, for less than 1% of world domestic product. Electrifying transportation will likely be a very big part of that combination. Where do you see the future of transportation? I, I'm extremely optimistic about electrifying vehicles. And the reason I'm optimistic is I think that would happen if we had no problem with the climate at all. Because the electric motor is an immensely more beautiful piece of machinery than a gas motor. It has essentially one moving part. If you, if you buy an electric car today, a Tesla or a Leaf or something, and you open up the owner's manual, they don't tell you to look at the engine as a, as a matter of regular maintenance until 125,000 miles have gone by. So no more visits to the expensive visits. And they accelerate fast. They're quiet. It's just a no-brainer. I'm very upbeat about electrification, but it won't do any good if all the electricity is coming from fossil fuels. So that's why it's still very important, not just to electrify existing, or so, uh, to decarbonize existing sources of electricity, but to be prepared for a big ramp up in the demand for strictly electrical energy which can be met by renewables and by nuclear power. So it's uh -huh. two in combination. So given the challenge of moving to zero carbon energy, in particular, this massive challenge of these large scale trends and improvements in standards of living in developing countries, which come with growing per capita emissions, what are the fundamental reasons, if there are any, for optimism? The reason I'm optimistic is that in the past, when we've seen major transformations, like from horses and buggies to cars, the advent of machinery and industrial processes and so forth, wise people have looked at this as an enormous opportunity. And so there's no doubt in the minds of serious people, creative people, inventors, and so forth, that we can come up with ways of taking carbon out of the atmosphere. We can come up with carbon-free energy sources. There's an enormous market for that. It sounds a bit crass and a bit Machiavellian, but the global energy market today is $7 trillion. All right. It's a third of U.S. GDP. It's a huge number. The nations, the individuals that can capture that market are going to do well. Right now, Russia and China are competing to be those nations, and the U.S. is hardly in the competition at all. Russia and China, China is the largest uh, builder of wind turbines, producer of solar PV, and Russia and China are competing for the nuclear export market. And this is something people don't really seem to know about, is that regardless of all our environmental movements in the West, Argentina, other countries in the Middle East are buying nuclear power plants from Russia or China because it makes sense. They, they're hedging against the idea that they might get taxed for carbon or that carbon may become unavailable for some reason, and they're going with that. And they're not going to be influenced by Western environmentalists necessarily. They're going to go forward. So why are they capturing that market? The choice for people who don't like nuclear is not whether there will be nuclear, there will. It's whether it's going to be Russian plants. These are the folks that brought us Chernobyl, the one accident whose radiation actually killed people in the nuclear power industry, or whether it's going to be ours or France's or Sweden's or something. That's the real world choice we have. 
So I'm optimistic. And, you know, if you're the leader of a rapidly developing or country poised to be rapidly developing like India, and you're looking at the fact that you're going to need enormous ramping up of power, not just for electricity industrial, you're going to be looking across the whole board. Right. And if you have to pay a little bit more for non-carbon, you might be willing to, for one reason, and it has nothing to do with climate, it's health. The health costs of carbon combustion, particularly the health costs that arise from particulates, are absolutely staggering. And the economic uh, activity lost by premature illness and death from this is, is very, very large. So that's a hidden cost. It's a cost borne by the healthcare sector, if you will. But it is a real cost for carbon combustion. And wise leaders know that and are willing to pay more, having nothing to do with climate. This is another incentive to develop low carbon energy sources, even independent of climate change. I'm very curious about that point as uh, foreign leaders look to sources of energy, you know, that, that will be opting away from carbon for those health reasons, et cetera. And I'm wondering, are those decisions made for the most part rationally in your view? Are we seeing that rational process play out the way that you're describing it? I know we should be seeing it as that because it makes rational sense, but do we in fact see that? It's, it's two steps forward and one step back. I mean, there's net progress, I think. There's net rational behavior in the wrong one, but there are mistakes made along the way, for sure. Okay, no, no question about it. But I think that the net trend is upward. And there's a lot of rhetoric, a lot of noise about Paris Accords. And it's all for the good in the sense that there's this sort of growing social pressure out there, and that does mean something to get people away from carbon. So if you have got a decision that's close between whether you're going to build a coal-fired power plant, a dam, a wind farm, or a nuclear power plant, that social pressure will weigh into the decision. It may not be the most important thing, but if it's economically close, it will sway things, particularly if you understand the health costs of things like coal combustion. You know, India... It's a country already struggling with enormous uh, air pollution problems that result from not just industrial activity, but ordinary uh, uh, stoves that people have in their houses that are burning wood or something else. And so there are a lot of incentives to go away from that. But I think in the long run, it will be rational. The most effective thing that we in the West can do, I think, is to innovate energy for the government and academic institutions, laboratories to put lots of energy into energy. That is lots of resources to get young people excited about innovating because there are a lot of ways we can go. And if we tell ourselves false narratives, which seems to be very popular these days in many fronts that, oh, it's all going to be solved by solar. We already have it. Just sit back and agitate politically for that or wind or something, they don't really get real about it and look at the alternatives and weigh them rationally. We're not going to get anywhere. Nevertheless, things will go forward if for no other reason that China and Russia are moving forward and South Korea and a bunch of other places. And it's a little bit sad as, as an American citizen to see my own country kind of sitting on the sidelines. But we still have an, an edge, I think, in innovation if only we would encourage it and nurture it along. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Emanuel, for, for being on, on the podcast. Great to have you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. For more of our conversation with Professor Emanuel, visit climatenow.com and watch our video, How We Know It's Happening, the scientific underpinnings of our confidence in human-caused climate change. On climatenow.com, you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter and podcasts with climate and energy experts, and watch other videos where we distill the key principles of climate and energy science to make sense of human-caused climate change and the path towards a zero-carbon future. Thanks so much for listening.